you are here for the first time, welcome to New Life Church. Thank you for visiting us today. We have been going through the book of Acts. We preach expository, expository, expository preaching. I even can't pronounce that name, a word. Um, verse by verse, we go through the books of the Bible, and we have been going through the book of Acts. We are in Acts chapter 13 at the moment. And last week, we studied the first recorded sermon of the Apostle Paul. And the sermon recorded is a summary of what probably was a much larger, longer message. But the main idea of the sermon was God's promise to send a Savior and His fulfillment of that promise in sending Jesus really demands a response from us. Well, in our passage today, we are going to notice several different responses to Paul's sermon. And the responses really still hold true today when people hear God's spoken word. And the title of my message this morning is The Good, the Bad, and the Inquisitive. All different responses from people that we will see in our passage this morning. So please turn with me to Acts chapter 13. We will read from verse 42 to chapter 14, verse 7. Acts chapter 13, verse 42. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. Remember that's in reference to the sermon that Paul preached. Verse 43. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up. Many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. Since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city, stirring up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Chapter 14. Now at Iconium they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of His grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. Well, let's pray before we dive into God's word this morning. Father, we pray this morning for your help. We praise your name, Lord, for who you are. And we exalt you for what you have done. Thank you for reminding us, Lord, that once and for all, you have paid the perfect sacrifice. And because of that, we can approach you today. We can learn about you, and the Spirit can draw us to you. And he would grant us repentance this morning and conviction where it is needed. So we pray all of this would happen this morning as we study your word, as we learn from your word we thank you that you have inspired your word and these words have been recorded for us to learn from and to grow from we pray lord as we 
look again at this another account of people's response to the gospel message that we would learn from it and that our confidence would grow in your character and in the gospel message so please lord teach us today we pray help us lord not just to be the hearers but to be the doers of your word in jesus name i ask amen so as i said earlier on this sermon that paul preached earlier on in the uh, chapter 13 was delivered at a synagogue which is called the Pisidian Antioch Synagogue, uh, which is in modern Turkey today. And since Paul was the disciple of the renowned Gamaliel, the synagogue officials, the Jewish synagogue officials, gave him the opportunity to bring the sermon. But of course, they were not ready for what Paul was going to preach. They had to have been surprised at what he had said. Now, just let me remind you, this is how Paul concluded his sermon in the synagogue. We see this in Acts chapter 13. If you have your Bibles, we don't have a slide for this, but if you will look at Acts chapter 13, the conclusion of his sermon, he says in verse 38, Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Verse 39, And by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Verse 40. Beware therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. And then verse 41. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. That was the conclusion of his sermon. Remember, Paul was speaking to a religious audience everyone there was in the synagogue they believed in god but they needed personally to put their trust and their faith in the promise of salvation through jesus christ they didn't believe that jesus was the messiah and they needed to put their faith in the words that paul was preaching so that those words of warning which we just read about wouldn't come upon them now the first response that we see in response to this sermon is an inquisitive response. And some people wanted to hear more. That is my first point this morning. We see in verse 42 and verse 43 the inquisitive. Look at verse 42. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. Now isn't it interesting in Acts chapter 13 verse 15, it was the synagogue officials who invited Paul to come and speak in the synagogue. But here in our verse, it is the people who are asking Paul to come back and preach again the next Sabbath. In verse 42, it says there that they begged Paul, they begged Paul to share more of the message that he was preaching. The message of the forgiveness of sins, which is in Jesus Christ. Now many of the people there in in the Antioch of Pisidia. Remember, they were heathens. They had become tired of the corruption in their, in their city, in their culture. They had become sick of the, the immoralities and the injustices of their society. And many of these people's hearts had been touched by what Paul was preaching. And of course, the Holy Spirit was at work as well. He was working in the hearts of these people. And many of these people realized that this message he was preaching had truth to it. It wasn't a message that they had heard before. And they knew for sure that it wasn't a message that had been invented by man. This was God's message. And they wanted to hear from God. They wanted to hear the very gospel. It was unlike anything that they had ever heard 
before. And Luke, who is writing the book of Acts, he emphasizes this. And I want you to see this emphasis. Look at verse 44 and at verse 46. Twice there, he refers to the Word of God in verse 44 and verse 46. And then, in verse 48 and verse 49, again, twice, he refers to the Word of the Lord. Okay? And then, in chapter 14, verse 3, he refers to it as the Word of His grace. The Word of His grace. Now, in other words, Luke wants to make it very clear to us that the Gospel did not originate from religiously clever men thinking up of a way, of a scheme of how we can be reconciled to God. This was from God. This was His word of grace. If you think about the world that we're living in at the moment, if you think about all the world's religions, we talked a little bit about this this morning in our, in our catechism class. All the world's religions that originate with man have their, their very beginnings from Satan. This involves a system of human works that supposedly are able to bring us back to God. There are only two types of religions in the world. Let me, let me make this simple. A religion of works and a religion of faith. A religion of works and a religion of faith. All the religions of the world, man-made, fall under the religions of works. You have to work for your salvation. You have to, you have to pray. You have to give alms. You, you have to, to, to chant a, a certain mantra. You have to do good things in order to go to heaven. And then you have the religion of faith. The religion that the Bible talks about of faith in Jesus Christ and the very gospel. The Bible plainly declares that even the best of us have fallen sin. No matter how good we are, no matter how much money we give to the church, no matter how many times we, we go on pilgrimage to holy sites, we all have sinned. And we all fall short of God's glory. And even those who strive to be righteous are filled with pride. And when we come to the cross of Christ as, as guilty sinners and simply receive what the Son of God did on our behalf, it is an act of faith. It is the act of faith in His grace. And rather than us taking the glory, God gets all the glory. Because there's nothing we can do to earn our salvation. It is all of God. Look at verse 43. It tells us there, Many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. Many people had turned to Christ, had turned to faith, and now they were encouraged to continue in the grace of God. Not to lean on works, not to lean on, on man's ways, man's philosophies, but to continue in the grace of God. And as they walked with them and they encouraged them to continue in the grace of God, isn't it awesome there that the work of salvation in these people's lives is referred to as grace? This is not something that they did. This is something God did. It's all of grace. But the following Sabbath, we see quite a crowd showed up on the scene after this sermon, after this powerful gospel sermon. In fact, this message of grace really shook the city of, of Antioch in their Pisidia. Really shook into the core. And you would think that everyone would welcome such a message, such a powerful message. But as we see the facts unfolding, the truth is many people hated the message as well. And we see in our second point that some people responded to the gospel by creating conflict. Our second point we see in verse 44, the troublemakers, the troublemakers. So Paul and Barnabas went back the next Sabbath, and almost the entire city now, is showing up for part two of this fantastic, powerful sermon which they had heard. But in the crowds, there are people there with selfish motives. People there who are intent on causing trouble. 
I mean, I just say some of the Jews were jealous because of the following that Paul and Barnabas had. So they started arguing. They started arguing with Paul and they were trying to destroy Paul's reputation and his credibility. Look at what happens at verse 44 there. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathers to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. Verse 46. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are now turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. We saw last week, and remember the week before last, that opposition to the gospel is given. And opposition to the gospel really must be expected. Satan does not want the gospel to go out. Because he knows the effects of the gospel. He knows that people would repent of their sins and turn to faith in Jesus Christ. And that's not what he wants. He wants people not to share the gospel. And when there's opposition, as we've, we've seen, we need to have a confidence in God and His gospel. Our confidence mustn't be in ourselves. Our confidence must be in God and His gospel. And have strong courage to face opposition. And that's what we see happening here with Paul and Barnabas. Despite this opposition, despite the persecution, they were not willing to move away meekly. They had a strong confidence in the very gospel of our, Jesus Christ, of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The Jewish leaders, despite the message that was being preached, rejected the truth. But we notice the Gentiles were receiving it now. The Gentiles were responding positively to this gospel message. Look at verse 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. The Gentiles were rejoicing that this salvation from God had come to them. But I want you to notice three things here in this verse, in verse 48. Verse 48 says that the Gentiles heard this. They heard it. Notice that. They really heard it. You know, sometimes we can, we can listen, isn't it? But we, 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 don't really, we don't really hear things, you know? Um, maybe husbands, you can relate to this. Sometimes when your wife is talking to you, she's, her mouth is moving, but you're just not hearing anything she's saying. Um, that never happens to me. I mean, never happens to me. <laughs> but the Gentiles heard what was being spoken. The Gentiles heard the message. They were listening to the Word of God. But look at the second part of verse 48. It says, When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and they glorified the Word of the Lord. Notice the response here. The Gentiles were glorifying God's Word. They held God's Word in the highest esteem. They treated God's Word as truth. They treated God's Word as the Word of God. They glorified the Word of the Lord. But look at the last part of verse 48. It says, As many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. The Gentiles were appointed to eternal life. The Gentiles believed the good news about what? About the cross of Christ. About God's love for them. About God's forgiveness. And his gift of eternal life. And they were saved. But the last phrase of verse 48 is one of the strongest phases, sorry, the strongest phrases in all of the Bible that really does affirm the doctrine of the sovereignty of God in salvation. As many as were appointed, it says, to eternal life believed. In the King James, that word appointed is translated as ordained. As many as were ordained to eternal life believe. 
Now I know some of you struggle with this, with this tension that we, we see in the Bible. This doctrine of election is there, but what about the will of man? There's this tension here. God's sovereignty and the will of man. Do we choose God or does, does God choose us? Now back in verse 39 it said, Everyone who believes is free. But here in verse 48 it says, As many as were appointed to eternal life believed. You see the tension here. Here are two great truths that really run parallel to each other. They don't run perpendicular to each other. They don't contradict each other. They are the same coin with two sides. You have the truth of human responsibility, everyone who believes. And then you've got the truth of God's ordained election. You've got a responsibility to respond to the gospel message. You've got to exercise your will to believe in Jesus. But the other great truth is the divine sovereignty of God. God is the one who chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. God is the one who predestines us to eternal life. And really, these two great truths are presented not as contradictory to each other. But here in this one passage, they are presented as parallel truths that are complementing each other. And I hope you see this here. Both exist. Both exist. And even though our finite minds might not be able to comprehend it, it is here in the Bible for us to see it. Romans 10 verse 9 and 10 says, If we confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. God is the one who chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. God is the one who predestines us to eternal life. But at the same time, there is this human responsibility. Everyone, everyone is responsible to respond to the gospel message. And everyone will be judged by their response to the gospel message. We are without excuse. We have to exercise our will. Whether we will respond in faith or whether we will reject the gospel message. We can't blame God's sovereignty for our lack of res or faithful response to the gospel message. That's how it has always been. And that's how it always will be. We see here the Jewish leaders who even knew portions of the Bible, who even knew the Old Testament, who even knew about the promises of the Messiah rejecting the gospel, responding in a negative way. But not only that, they start to hate the gospel. The Jewish leaders are stirred up and they try to stir up other people, important people in the, in the city, so that they could persecute Paul and Barnabas and kick them out of the town. But notice that Paul and Barnabas, what do they do? They shake off the dust of their feet and they move on to another town, believing that God has His people. That people will respond faithfully to the gospel message if they just share the gospel with those people that God has ordained. Look at verse 52. This verse is for those who who get discouraged when people do not want to hear the gospel, when people don't respond positively. Not everyone is going to respond positively, and we need to remember that. But notice their response, Paul and Barnabas, they did not allow these people who kicked them out of town to discourage him. Instead, it says they were filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. So what a contrast. Notice here, what a contrast between Paul and Barnabas and the Jews. In verse 45, Luke tells us that the Jews were filled with jealousy. But what does it say in verse 52? He says, Paul and Barnabas were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Do you see the contrast there? Even though they were inciting violence 
against them, even though they were trying to drive them out of the region, even though not everyone received the message in a, in a positive way, they were filled with joy and love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? That's the question. Why? I believe Paul and Barnabas responded this way because they could never get over the grace of God in their own lives. They believed the gospel message and they preached it to whoever they could. They loved the message of the grace of God. And as they preached the gospel to other people, they were reminded over and over and over again of the mercy of God towards them, towards themselves. They were reminded over and over again of what they did not deserve. God who should have sentenced them to hell to pay for their sins, instead has given them eternal life, has given them the forgiveness of their sins. And all of us who put our faith in Jesus should respond in the same way. We deserve nothing at God's hands. We deserve hell. We deserve hell, folks. Yet, God has given us all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. That is grace. That is grace right there. And our response to opposition, and our response to persecution, must be determined by our love for God and the Gospel message of grace. Our response should not be determined by what we think of man or what man will think of us. Our fear of man. However people choose to respond to the gospel, we need to keep our focus on Jesus. And faithfully and boldly proclaim the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Even in our difficult circumstances. And that's what we see here in our third point. In verse, chapter 14, we see from verse 3 to 7, the brave and the bold. So we see the unbelieving Jews stirring up Gentiles and poisoning the minds against the Christians. But Paul and Barnabas, they don't quit and they don't go home. What do they do? Look at verse 3. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord who bore witness to the word of His grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So understand what is happening here, okay? The opposition was gently boiling. It's just, there's this bubbling going on. There's no real explosion happening right at this point. There's just this smoldering bitterness and hatred towards the, the Christians. Verse 3 tells us that they, despite this, remained a long time. It took a while for this to unfold, apparently. But the Lord kept the lid on this, on this boiling pot of, of bitterness for a long time. And that word there, long time, in the Greek, can um, elsewhere has been used to speak of as much as three years and as little as a month. So they were there for a long time. They were there for... Probably several months. They remained in the city. They continued to preach the gospel. They continued to teach boldly in the Lord. And the Lord gave testimony unto the word of His grace, it says. And granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. The Lord confirmed what they were preaching by miracles and they were able to stay a long time even though the opposition continued to to fester but now notice the word that that keys on our point here and that is the word boldly look at it boldly they paul and barnabas they knew this resentment was brewing they were very aware of the the dangerous nature of the events to come they knew it was inevitable, and yet 
they were bold in their continuing to preach the gospel. And I think that's a quality that really makes all the difference in the Christian life. When we talk about boldness, I think it involves two things. Boldness involves two things. Standing for truth in the face of fear. And secondly, following Christ no matter the cost. Standing for truth in the face of fear and following Christ, no matter the cost. We see this characteristic here in the Apostle Paul and Barnabas. This was absolutely characteristic of the Apostle Paul. I mean, he didn't even know how to live any other way. Um, he had this tremendous commitment to boldness. We, we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, just for example. Paul says, but though... We had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi. As you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. And he says, even when we've been beaten, and even when we were treated shamefully, we were still bold. We were still bold. You could never frighten Paul. There just wasn't, there just wasn't any way to stop him. And I believe the boldness is a necessity for any effective service for the Lord. John MacArthur once said that nobody ever accomplished anything for God in the long run without boldness. And I think he's right. I think he's absolutely right. I said last week, or the week before last, that our, our boldness must come from a strong confidence in our God and His gospel. Our confidence mustn't come in, in our abilities and, and our education and our knowledge or our personality. Our boldness must come from a strong confidence in our God and His gospel. God is not going to honor fear. God is not going to honor doubt. Satan wants doubting Christians. Satan is hoping for fearful Christians. He does not want the gospel to go out because he knows that God will use it to open people's eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God. Like I said previously, New Life Church, if we are going to be a fruitful, effective church fulfilling our Lord's great mission, we need to have a boldness in face of opposition. Look at verse 5 there. When an attempt was made by both Gentile and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding country, and there they continued to preach the gospel. Paul and Barnabas became aware of the intentions of the, the Jews, and they, they moved over to Lystra and, and Derby. When it looked like they were about to, to be stoned, they moved to another city. They had done this already, remember, in Pisidia. They shook off the dust from their, their feet and they moved along. But the point is that they didn't let the opposition or even the threat of death stop them from their mission. They didn't let this threat stop them from preaching the gospel. They moved along and continued to preach it elsewhere. But notice there, Luke tells us, go back to verse 49, that the word of the Lord was being spread through the whole region. The word of the Lord was being spread through the whole region. Now the apostle Paul and Barnabas couldn't have been responsible for this spread through the whole region. This must have been other Christians who were involved in the preaching of the word. This wasn't just two people. The other believers who had received this word of grace, who had embraced God's gospel and repented of their sins, were now telling other people about this gospel of grace. And the word of God is spreading now through the whole region because of other believers who are being faithful with this message of 
salvation. People who were amazed at God's amazing grace went around telling other people about God's amazing grace. Those who understood God's mercy towards them went around telling others, despite the opposition that was building up, despite the, the threat. You know, we often talk about evangelism as, as our responsibility, which it is. But it is more than our responsibility. It, is, it should be our joy. It should be our pleasure. It should be our privilege to tell others of, of God's grace. Especially when people are struggling. Especially when people are in difficult times. We have this gospel message and we can share with them. There's our confidence in this gospel message. It is our pleasure, it is our, our joy to tell others about God's plan for us. <coughs> you know, we've all been watching this Russian invasion of Ukraine that's been unfolding this week. And it has been shocking to hear news reports mentioning the beginning of, of World War III and to <coughs> watch footage of explosions and seeing tanks and Russian armored vehicles roll over cars in in, in U, U, Ukraine it's been horrifying and Adina was telling me that you know, she's been receiving messages from many of her old performers that used to work for her and many of them are currently living in, in bomb shelters and, and subway stations Hannah was telling us about friends of hers living in bomb shelters at the moment I've heard of churches meeting in subway stations. <coughs> but here's an, here's an excerpt from, a, from an article I read this week from a Ukrainian pastor, Pastor Vassil. He's from Open Bible Church in Ukraine. He says, We have decided to stay both as a family and as a church. We want to serve the people here along with Open Bible Church where I joined the pastoral team in 2016. In anticipation of coming disasters, we've bought a supply of food, medicine, and fuel so that, if necessary, we'll be able to help those in need rather than burden them. When this is over, the citizens of Kiev will remember how Christians have responded in a time of need. Through prayers and His Word, we've gained confidence and peace. And we believe God is with us, and that is the most important Thing. They believe God is with them. You know, we will never be bold. We will never do anything for God's glory if we don't love the gospel of our Lord and Savior. We will never be brave until we love the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, how is it possible? How is it possible to share what Christ has done on the cross for sinners if, if you have never met Jesus personally? If you've never embraced Him as your master and as your king. Now why would anybody stay behind in a war-torn country and face the, the threat of, of death and all the horrors of war when they could leave and go to another country? Why would they do that? Well, not just anybody would do that, folks. Only those who believe the gospel. Only those who've embraced the gospel. Only those who look forward to the Lord's return. And are filled with the joy of the Lord and the love of the Lord would be able to do that. And only those who want to display the beauty of God to others in times of need would do that. Only those who have never gotten over the grace of God in their own lives. Our response to opposition and persecution must be determined by our love for God, not our fear of man. Can I repeat that? Our response to opposition and persecution must be determined by our love for God, not our fear of man. However, unbelie however unbelievers choose to respond to the gospel, we need to keep our focus on Jesus. And faithfully and boldly 
proclaim the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'm running out of time, but I want to close with this reading from Corrie Ten Boom's book. You may be familiar with this lady. Um, during the last world war, as the German armies rolled over most of Europe, crushing countries in their paths, Corrie Ten Boom and her family who lived in the Netherlands, they provided refuge and shelter for, for many Jewish people in their own homes as they were hiding them away from the Nazis. But in her book she says, My own family and my friends and I did all that we could to save Jews, to save Jewish lives until we were betrayed and arrested. At that time my father was 84 years of age and friends and friends had often warned him that if he persisted in hiding Jews in his home under the very eye of the occupying armies, he could surely face imprisonment. I am too old for the prison life, my father replied. But if that should happen, then it would be for me an honor to give my life for God's ancient people, the Jews. I recall with great clarity the day, February the 28th, 1944, that we went down to the winding staircase with our whole family and friends. And Father leaned heavily on my arm, and passing the large Phrygian clock in the hall, he suggested that I pull up the weights to wind it. He could not realize that the next day when the clock unwound, there would be no one, only silence, in that so recently crowded, lively, joyful house. And that never again as a family would we enter Father's beloved house with its many clocks. 35 of our family and friends were led through the cement strat toward the police station that day. That night, God used Father to prepare each of us in a special way for the unknown times that lay ahead. And Father asked my brother Willem to read Psalm 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. After an hour's ride from there, the van door opened and the gates of the prison closed behind us. We were ordered to stand with our faces pressed against the red brick wall. And when our names were called, I passed by a father who was sitting on a chair. He looked up and we heard him softly saying, The Lord be with you, my daughters. From that moment forward, Everything in our lives was changed. We did not know what was ahead of us, but I was certain of one thing, that Jesus would never leave us or forsake us, and that for a child of God, no pit could be so deep that Jesus was not deeper still. I never saw my father again, but I look forward to the day when I would see him in heaven. Only those who have embraced the gospel can look forward to heaven. Amen? Amen. And our response to opposition and our response to persecution must be determined by our love for God, not by our fear of man. However, unbelievers choose to respond to the gospel. We need to keep our focus on Jesus and faithfully proclaim the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't know what the future holds for us here in the UAE, but should war come, or even opposition, or persecution, or even peace, let's pray that we will be faithful, and that we would speak boldly for the Lord, and be a witness to the word of His grace. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for those that have gone before us, that have been faithful to the very end. Help us to live like you died for us, unashamed of the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask in his precious name.